sister Sadia from California emails saying that uh, she wishes to perform the Hajj but her situation does not allow her to have a mahram traveling with her and so she is aware of the controversies over a, f uh, a lady traveling without the mahram she is saying that she's going to go in the standard packages of hajj for in america that go in large groups and um uh, obviously she's aware that people say it's haram and it's not and it's uh, and is halal she just wants my opinion and to summarize the uh, the, the the differing views in this regard وما أرسلنا من قبلك إلا رجالا نوحي إليهم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون so our sister uh, Sadia is well aware that this is nothing new. This is a standard age-old controversy it goes back a thousand two hundred years, uh, and in our times it has been rekindled because obviously of the uh, changes of the, uh, the 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 realities of the worlds that we live in, and this controversy. It has been manifested in many of the Q and A that I'm doing uh, throughout these series, and that is the the notion of. If we understand the cause of a ruling, does the ruling still apply or not? And this is a very common controversy from the beginning of time. Okay, if we understand why something has been, uh, not the wisdom, because that's something else, hikmah is something else. If we understand the cause, if we understand the reason uh, that a particular ruling has been given, then if that cause no longer exists, can the ruling be made lax? And this is, I've done many Q&A that I've gone over this uh, back and forth, and I have spoken about this reality that from the time of the Sahaba, we had uh, w w what we can call the more literalist streak. If the hadith says it, that's it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And we have those that are more uh, thinking about the goals of the Sharia, ah, right? And again, this, this tension exists. It's not, it's not quite, it is a type of tension, but it is a tension that we should respect, that both sides are there. This this notion of, of a tight, slight tension it exists even in the life of the Prophet وسلم, in the famous incident that I have gone over in a lot of detail when the Prophet وسلم, said to the Muslim community after the Battle of the Trench, do not pray Asr until you get to Banu uh, Quraidah. Do not pray Asr until you get to the tribe of Banu Quraidah. And a large group of Muslims started walking way beyond the time they should have. They left late for reasons beyond their control and Asr has come and Asr is about to go and Maghrib is about to come in and they haven't prayed Asr and they began to talk amongst themselves that did the Prophet literally mean do not pray Asr till you get to Bani Quraida or was the point hurry up and make sure you get to Bani Quraida before Asr because if he literally meant do not pray Asr then we're going to let Maghrib come in and we're going to walk all the way there not praying Asr and then we'll pray Asr after Maghrib because the Prophet's literal wording do not pray Asr except at Banu Quraida and so they differed and one group said no it's the literal meaning and they did not pray until they got to Banu Quraida and Asr time had gone, the sun had set, they haven't prayed Asr and they prayed Asr and then they prayed Maghrib. Another group said no, I mean it's obvious that the Prophet is saying this come out at Dhuhr time and he's telling us make sure you pray Asr in Banu Quraida. The point is get to Banu Quraida before Maghrib and for whatever reason we left late, that's not happening. So we look at the goal, we look at the, 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 the purpose of saying that we don't have to be literal here. In the lifetime of the Prophet this kernel was demonstrated. And do you know what the Prophet did? Nothing. He accepted both because they both tried their best effort, right? Unfortunately, what we have, and I'll be very honest here, is that amongst the uh, many of the religious-minded folks, there is a strong streak of literalism. And amongst those that are not so practicing, this literalism rubs them the wrong way and they even become even less practicing because of the what they view as the fanaticism of the religious crowd. And as usual, the middle path is always the best path. And if you listen to my Q&A, you will see that I usually uh, 
uh, ally myself with those that look at the goals and look at what's going on. And, and also there must be precedent. We don't just, we have to follow ulama. We don't just invent from the top of our heads. And every time I quote something, I quote you ulama of the past or of the present who are holding uh, these views. As I have said many times, I do not consider myself to be an independent mujtahid a'udhu billah that gives you my own ijtihad. On the contrary, I always reference greater scholars than myself so that you understand that uh, this is not me who is speaking. So our sister, uh, Sadia asks about the female traveling alone. And I say to her and to all of you that this issue of whether we should look at the literal hadith, by the way, what is a literal hadith? The Prophet ﷺ said, it is not allowed for a woman who believes in Allah in the last day that she travels the distance of a day and a night except that she has her mahram with her, okay? It is not allowed for a lady who really has iman that she goes alone a whole day's journey outside the city all alone unless she has a mahram with her. Now, it is obvious that this is not an act of worship. It is obvious that, you know, this is a very common sense rule. When in a time of lawlessness, in a time of no governments and whatnot, we don't want a woman to be all alone in the middle of the desert. It's obvious here. So the question arises, should we be literal? Or should we say, okay, in cases where uh, it is not going to be a danger, that it is permissible. So uh, some of the great scholars, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Hanifa and their madhabs, they basically said, yes, it should be literal. And we should not allow any woman to ever travel unless she is with her mahram. And Imam al-Shafi'i from the beginning said, if she is in a safe place, land and a safe zone. And she is with a group that is protective, even if it's a group of large ladies, a lot of ladies traveling, right, uh, together, then it is permissible. You have to look at the safety and you use your common sense. You you, you assume your common sense. I, nobody knows the future, right? And, and in reality, you can, may Allah protect us all, you can get killed in your house. You know, so we don't look at the improbability. We look at overall, like Imam Shari was saying, غَلَبَةُ الظَّنِ Like overall, if it is a safe environment and a safe land, and she's in a, a group that we know she's going to be safe, then it is permissible for her to go for Hajj and Umrah. So this is a reality we go, as I said, it goes back to the earliest of times. And uh, in this case, and, and uh, Imam al-Shatibi, one of the great scholars of Andalus, Imam al-Shatibi, uh, who was really a brilliant uh, scholar who talked about, and he's, he's writing this 800 years ago, right? And he's writing about the philosophy of the laws of the Sharia. That uh, Imam al-Shatibi says that when it comes to the rituals that Allah told us to do, then we do not look at the how and the reasons, we simply do the rituals. But when it comes to the customs and the laws related to the customs, in this case, we should look at the goal of the law, the spirit of the law. We should look at what is the law attempting to accomplish here. And therefore, because of this, uh, many of the early scholars said that it is allowed for the lady to travel in case there is uh, you know, overall the presumption of safety. And we have, for example, Al-Hassan Al-Basri of the earlier scholars, Al-Awza'i, one of the one of the founders of one of the lost madhabs. You know, we say there are four madhabs. When you study uh, fiqh, you will realize, in fact, there were over 30 madhabs at one point in time. But for historical reasons, for historical reasons, four of them were solidified and codified and made popular. In reality, during that heyday of the glory period of fiqh, there were madhabs all across the Muslim world. There were scholars to the caliber of Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad and Imam Abu Hanif and Imam Malik to their caliber. And of them was Imam al Awza'i. And by the way, the Awza'i Madhab was the Madhab of Andalus for many years, right? Until the Maliki Madhab came. So the Awza'i Madhab did flourish for a period of time. And Imam al Awza'i, in his fiqh, he did allow for a lady to travel in uh, if there is safety. Imam Dawood al Zahiri uh, also did this. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah himself. As his student Ibn Muflih says that Ibn Taymiyyah himself said that it is allowed for a woman to perform Hajj if she is in safe circumstances, even if uh, there is no mahram with her. If she is amina, amina here means she is safe. If there, we presume that she's gonna be safe, then she may go for hajj. And then Ibn Taymiyyah says, and this permissibility applies to every travel that is a travel for the sake of worshiping Allah, i.e. 
going to visit her parents, going for an Islamic conference, every travel that is a good travel, that you're doing it. Obviously, and I'm being brutally honest here, we want to protect our women, and women are uh, subject to more crimes than men, it is understood. We don't want a lady to go uh, vacationing all alone. I'll be very honest here, it's not something we want because we want to protect our women. At the same time, to say that no woman can travel, you know, for Hajj and Umrah, no woman can travel for an Islamic conference, no woman can travel to visit her mother and father. And in reality, the times that we live in, you know, she goes to the airport in one city, and she's sitting in a plane with people that, generally speaking, I mean, this is a, you know, uh, not, not we're, she is safer in public spaces than perhaps she is going to be in some apartment complexes that she might be living in. You know what I'm saying? So realistically speaking, uh, to make this a very big deal and to say this and that, and in reality there's a standard position as I said uh, from the Shafi'i school uh, and from Ibn Taymiyyah and from Al-Awza'i and Hassan al-Basri and others and this is back in those days now in our times we can in fact make an even stronger argument because the reality is that in those days you would be walking in the middle of the desert from city to city and those scholars allowed it whereas in our times we're talking about safe buses or safe travel or main highways or even more safer than this is airlines right you're sitting in an airplane with 300 people you know you're dropped off at the airport and then or even in a major city you go to the airport and then you 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 go to the other city and you have another civilization over there and so in reality uh, to make this issue one in which we, uh, you know, make everything haram and the sisters are not, you know, doing this and that. I, I think that this is not in the spirit of the Sharia. And so the position that I follow is that of Ibn Taymiyyah and that of uh, the Shafi'i school, or I should say the majority of the Shafi'i school, as in every madhab, you always find, uh, you know, other voices. We do look at the reality of the situation we are in. And by the way, even amongst many of the very uh, conservative scholars, uh, they did allow this. For example, Sheikh Ibn Jibreen also allows this, and others, they allowed a woman to travel uh, for a legitimate reason if uh, the, the situation was safe, because the goal of this hadith was for her protection, as simple as that. The goal of this hadith is that we don't want billah, anything to happen. And so if, generally speaking, and by the way, there's an evidence from the hadith that is used, and that is the famous uh, hadith in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a time will come before the Day of Judgment that a lady shall travel from uh, Hadramaut to Sana'a. He mentioned two cities in Yemen, far, far away. A lady shall travel all alone from that city to that city with a flock of sheep as the shepherd and she shall fear none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the person of taqwa, and she will fear the wolf attacking the sheep. Now, this hadith is very profound because even though it's not fiqh, the Prophet is predicting that a time will come when a lady, young lady, will travel with a lot of wealth. Sheep is easy wealth. Sheep is you just grab it and you go, okay? So she's a lady by herself. She has a large amount of wealth and the Prophet is describing that's going to happen. And he didn't say, A'udhu Billah, she doesn't have Iman. He said she fears Allah. He affirmed she has Iman. And he's the one who said, no woman who believes in Allah should travel without a mahram. So how do we reconcile these two? It is self-evident. If the road is safe, and there's no problem in fear and worry, then this ruling does not apply. And if there is any danger, then any lady who truly believes in Allah on the last day, she should not be all alone out there in the middle of nowhere. Allah knows what's gonna happen. So it's very clear here that, you know, the, the, the context is what dictates which of these two should be done. And the Prophet is informing us in a manner that clearly indicates he's approving. And in a way, there's a boast as well, that security will be so much and this is the point here, security. She's gonna travel fearing none. She's safe, she knows nobody's gonna harm her. Because of that, she's traveling. And the Prophet is telling us she's traveling and he's not reprimanding that travel. What does that indicate? So dear brothers, before you jump to only one hadith and one madhab, that's fine, I understand. At least respect and tolerate the other and then understand sometimes, sometimes, given the modern world that we live in, to be too strict is going to backfire and it will cause people to turn away from religiosity. So our sister said she is aware of the debate. She wants my two cents if you like. I appreciate her trust in me and wanting me to summarize. I hope that inshallah with this I have made the, 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 the question clear that 
any mubah travel, any travel that is in and of itself permissible, and especially if it is done for a good cause. She is visiting a relative, you know, she's visiting her parents, she's attending an Islamic conference, she's going for Hajj and Umrah, and overall she's in the company of righteous people. It's a group, Hajj group, we all know. Hajj groups of America, mashallah, you know, 50, 100 people, they're all going, they're, they're gonna take care of her and everything. Yeah, and he, frankly, Frankly, that safety is in many cases higher than if she goes to the mall all alone in her local in her local area, right? So to make that haram because of an interpretation of the hadith, yani, I, I think that that is not wise in our times. And I respect all positions out there, but you ask me my opinion, and I think that the Shafi'i school and Ibn Taymiyyah and others, this is what really makes sense in our times, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And inshallah with that, we will uh, end for today and continue next week with the night ta'ala. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا من أجبت دعاء نوح فانتصر وحملته في فلكك المشحول يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون